Section 7 of The Catholic's Ready Answer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill Section 7 The Bible and the People An Accusation it is notoriously the settled policy of Rome to withhold the Bible from the people. Witness the number of decrees on the subject in the history of the papacy. Versions of the Bible in the language of the people have been an object of the Church's special aversion. The Answer As a general proposition, it is untrue that the Church withholds or desires to withhold the Bible from the people. The Church has at times passed restrictions not precisely on Bible reading, but on the reading of certain versions of the Bible, and even then only when such restrictions were necessary as preventatives of serious harm. The Bible is indeed a sacred thing, but the most sacred of things may be abused, and who will deny that the Bible has been abused in the hands of the unworthy? The prevention of such abuse is so rational that the opposition of Protestants to it would be quite unintelligible if we were not aware of the effect of early education in scaling up the minds against all access of new ideas that seem to conflict with early impressions. Dare be open-minded on the subject of the Bible is the friendly admonition we would give to our Protestant readers. Now in detail. What are the real facts of the case? The first fact takes the shape of a letter. It may be found among the introductory pages of the modern reprints of the Douai or Douai Bible, which is in every good Catholic household. It is written by Pius VI to Archbishop Martini of Florence in reference to the latter's translation of the Bible into Italian. The following is the text of the English translation of the part of the letter that particularly concerns us. Beloved Son, Health and Apostolic Benediction At a time that a vast number of bad books which most grossly attack the Catholic religion are circulated even among the unlearned to the great destruction of souls, you judge exceedingly well that the faithful should be excited to be reading the Holy Scriptures, for these are the most abundant sources which ought to be left open to every one to draw from them purity of morals and of doctrine, to eradicate the errors which are widely disseminated in these corrupt times. This you have seasonably effected, as you declare, by publishing the sacred writings in the language of your country, suitable to every one's capacity, especially when you show and set forth that you have added explanatory notes, which, being extracted from the Holy Fathers, preclude every possible danger of abuse. Dated April 1, 1778. Close quote. Here we see the precious treasury of God's Word, placed within the reach of all who have a knowledge of the language in which the version is printed, whilst at the same time precautions are taken against any abuse of it. The Word of God is given in its entirety, but its interpretation is safeguarded by extracts from the Fathers, that is to say, from the great authorities of early Christian ages. The version of the Bible praised by the Pontiff is in the Italian language, but that was not by any means the first time that the sacred writings appeared in a modern tongue. Our second fact is that in nearly every modern language there have been numerous translations of the entire Bible. As these versions were either positively approved or appeared with the knowledge of the authorities, it is altogether impossible that the settled policy of the Church can have been to withhold the Bible from the people. To anyone who knows the facts or even a fraction of them, the accusation must seem to be a calumny. Germany, the birthplace of the Reformation, is conspicuous for the number of editions of the whole Bible in the language of the people produced in Catholic times. Bibles in German were among the very first products of the printing press. The art of printing, we may remark in passing, is an invention of Catholic days 
and printing presses were at work more than half a century before Luther's revolt in 1517, sending forth to the world copies of the Bible in Luther's own language. Between 1466 and 1518 there appeared as many as fourteen editions of the complete Bible in High German and five in Low German. This is a fact which no historian of today will deny, though it is probably never mentioned within the walls of a non-Catholic Sunday school. In the light of this fact, Luther's dramatic story about the joy and delight he felt in discovering, at the age of twenty, a complete Bible, of which he had hitherto seen only fragments in the homilies, must seem quite astonishing. If the story is true, it is significant not as pointing to the rarity of Catholic Bibles, but as throwing a light of its own upon the character of Luther's education. The truth is that in the schools which Luther attended as a boy, the ancient classics were the absorbing and almost exclusive subject of study, this according to his own testimony, whereas in the more conservative schools and in those which the traditional methods of the church were followed, the Bible was part of the regular curriculum. We have said nothing, though much might be said, about the numerous German versions of the whole or of parts of the Bible issued in manuscript before the invention of printing. It was the work of a lifetime to produce, and it required a little fortune to purchase, a manuscript of the entire Bible before the printing era had dawned. Still, the laborious work of producing was carried forward in the monasteries and the demand on the part of those who were able to purchase was large enough to occasion the production of an immense number of copies of the scripture, some of which are still extant. It is needless to say anything of the numerous editions of the Bible in Germany which have appeared in recent centuries. The Alioli edition, with its clear and copious exposition of the text, would alone be sufficient to disprove the assertion that versions of the Bible and the language of the people are the Church's special aversion. In the Italian language eleven printed editions of the whole Bible appeared before the end of the fifteenth century. Much the same story might be told about Spain and France. In England the people had the open Bible from the earliest centuries. Anglo-Saxon versions of Scripture are well known to scholars. Fragments of them are extant and may be read in modern reprints. When, in the course of time, the old language became unintelligible, the Bible was rendered into the more modern tongue. Even Kramer admits as much. When, he remarks, the Saxton language waxed old and out of common usage, because folk should not lack the fruit of reading the Scripture, was again translated into the newer language, whereof yet also many copies remain and be daily found. Blessed Thomas More, whose word carries as much weight with non-Catholics as with Catholics, tells us, Myself has seen and can show you Bibles fair and old, which have been known and seen by the bishop of the diocese, and left in layman's hands and women's, to such as he knew for good and Catholic folk that used it with soberness and devotion. Even so stout a champion of Protestantism as John Fox cannot refrain from adding his voice to the general chorus of testimony. If histories be well examined, he assures us, we shall find both before the conquest and after, as well before John Wycliffe was born and since, the whole body of the scriptures by sundry men translated into this our country tongue. Strange, you will say, that such thorough-paced anti-Romanists as Fox and Kramer should have let the cat out of the bag as they would seem to have done in the above passages. But the truth probably is that, whilst they knew it would serve their immediate purpose to make the true statements we have quoted, they never suspected the controversial use to which their words would be put in a later age. Since 1582 English-speaking countries have had the New Testament and since 1609 the Old Testament translated into modern English idiom. The Douai or Douai Bible is a familiar object in Catholic households. 
In a word, the open Bible is a well-attested fact as regards the Catholics of the world, and our case is made out. Not so, says a voice somewhere in the audience. There may have been an English Catholic Bible, but it must have had few readers, as there was a positive ban put upon the reading of the Scriptures in the English tongue. But this is our answer. Never, either in England or elsewhere, has the Church banned a Bible because it was in the language of the people. But it has forbidden the reading of certain versions of the Bible which perverted the meaning of Holy Writ. Could the Church of God have done less? Granted a Church with authority, and what is a Church without authority? Was she to permit the Scriptures to appear with a falsified text? Whatever action the Church has ever taken with regard to English Bibles, it was entirely of a piece with its legislation from the beginning, whose object was to preserve from pollution the stream of divine revelation. To this legislation all Christian churches are indebted for their possession of a Christian Bible of any kind. But let us glance at the facts of the case. The reader will hardly need to be informed that in the fourteenth century a priest named John Wycliffe was cited to appear before the ecclesiastical authorities to answer the charge of heresy. Wycliffe had been styled the morning star of the Reformation, in accordance with the Protestant fashion of claiming kinship with all those who have had difficulties with their ecclesiastical superiors regarding matters of faith. But anti-Romanism, like misery, acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. Wycliffe was indeed in many respects the morning star of the Reformation, but there is no orthodox Protestant of the present day who would not be shocked by certain of his views which are not even Christian. He died in apparent communion with the Church, but he had fairly launched what was known after his death as the Lollard Heresy. The Lollards were fanatical revolutionists, equally dangerous to the Church and to society. It was against the Lollard perversions of Scripture that the Church directed her anathemas. In 1408 a convocation held at Oxford forbade any unauthorized person to translate the Scriptures, and who will say that such provisions are not within the right of a church, tracing its descent to the apostles, the greatest of whom, St. Peter, 2 Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, warns solemnly against wresting the Scriptures from their true meaning, whether by mistranslation or by any other process. The convocation forbade, in the second place, anyone to read without approbation any version of Scripture made either during or after Wycliffe's lifetime. And Wycliffe had died twenty-four years before. As Blessed Thomas More remarks, We hope, dear reader, you see in this law nothing unreasonable, since it neither forbids good translations to be read that were already made of old before Wycliffe's time, nor condemns his because it was new, but because it was naught, that is, bad, perverse. How, then, it may be asked, after so wide a diffusion of the Scriptures in the vernacular languages, could the notion ever have arisen that the Church would fain keep the Bible from the people? We shall have to let our readers puzzle over it. But our opponents have one more shaft in their quiver. It must be conceded that Catholics are anything but a Bible-reading body. Bibles are multiplied, but Bible-readers are not. In answer to this reproach, we would remark, in the first place, that in this matter it is easy to exaggerate the contrast between Catholics and Protestants. There is a vast deal more reading of Scripture among Catholics than is suspected outside the Church. Priests, to begin with, are obliged daily to recite an office in which there is always a portion of the sacred text from the New or the Old Testament. Many priests have devoted their lives to a study of the sacred writings. Beside the priests there are hundreds of thousands following the way of the councils, and these have scarcely any counterpart in Protestantism. To wit, the members of the religious orders, who meditate daily on the life of our blessed Saviour as narrated in the Gospels. 
The public reading of scripture is also a common practice in houses of religious. For the faithful at large, passages from the Gospels and Epistles are selected to be read from the pulpit. Children are taught their Bible history, which is sometimes worded from the text of the Bible itself. In some of our Sunday schools, the older pupils receive special instruction in the Bible. Anyone who knows the run of Catholic publications must be acquainted with a number of small annotated editions of the Gospels, which are issued to meet the demands for Bible knowledge among Catholics. A good deal of this will be a surprise to our non-Catholic friends, but this is only a sample of what they have yet to learn about their Catholic neighbors. And besides all this, it is a fact of no small importance that whilst the reading of the Bible has undoubtedly been on the increase among Catholics, it has very notably decreased among other Christian denominations. But significant as these facts certainly are as showing how much the Scriptures have been held in reverence by Catholics, we confess we do not by any means stake our case, nor should we, even if the facts were double or treble their present volume, on the amount of Bible reading which may be placed to the credit of Catholics. If the Bible readers were even fewer than they are, we should not be a bit concerned if we could feel any assurance that they were growing in appreciation of what is to them of much more importance than even Bible reading. If, for instance, they were daily learning to appreciate more and more the need and the efficacy of divine grace, especially as received through the sacraments, if they were conceiving daily a greater sorrow and detestation for sin, which they know is a condition for receiving pardon in the sacrament of penance, if in greater number and with growing fervor they were dedicating their lives to the service of their neighbor for the sake of him who regards what is done to the least of his brethren as done to himself, and all these are known to be distinctive Catholic traits, then we should be reconciled to their comparative neglect of Scripture reading. After all, it is the general point of view of the two religions, respectively, that makes the greater part of the difference between Catholics and Protestants in this matter. Given a religion that takes its stand solely on the Bible, there is at once an antecedent likelihood that a sort of omnipresence of the Bible will be a distinguishing feature of that religion. But given a religion which holds that Christ established a living authority, whose teachings are by a special providence preserved from error, in whose custody the sacred writings are placed, and from whose first commission teachers a considerable part of those writings have emanated, we mean, of course, those forming the New Testament, at once the Bible ceases to be the be-all and end-all of a man's religion. It takes its place beside another great oracle of divine wisdom, in which is heard the living voice of apostolic authority. Before drawing this article to a close, we would add that there is another important reason why the Bible, at least the whole Bible, is not so universally or indiscriminately read by Catholics. There are passages in the Old Testament which should never be placed under the eyes of the young or the frivolous, in whose case a morbid curiosity might easily turn the sacred text into an instrument of harm. The use to which the Bible has frequently been put by both of the classes mentioned is only too well known. And now, finally, we would ask our Protestant friends, what do they fancy could have been the Church's motive? for its supposed policy of depriving the people of the word of God. We have seen that, as a matter of fact, she did not deprive them of that treasure, as the Bible has been rendered into all the vernacular tongues in every age of the Church's history. But had she adopted a different policy, what could she have feared or hoped for by so doing? Were the contents of Scripture a secret of which none but a few possessed a knowledge? Or were they a secret on which depended her power or influence or the personal advantage of her rulers? The very notion of such secrecy is too absurd to be entertained for a moment. The Bible was as open as could be in all the languages known to scholars, or clerks as they were called in those days, among the laity and the clergy. And yet the clerks were the very class that could trouble the peace of the church most. They were the reading and thinking class, 
and independence of judgment would naturally assert itself in their ranks more than elsewhere. As for a reading public in anything like the modern sense, it simply did not exist. And yet, as we have seen, even for the comparative few who could read, or had leisure to read, the Church provided the Scriptures in the common tongue. In giving the Scriptures to all classes, the Church was not unmindful of the admonition of the Apostle that the sacred writings contain many things difficult to be understood, and things which the unlearned and the unstable rested to their own destruction. For, inculcating as she did obedience to the Church, as the divinely appointed interpreter of the Scriptures, she reduced the danger of a reckless and independent interpretation to the minimum. The non-Catholic reader of the Bible has no such safeguard, and hence Catholics might justly charge the Protestant churches with placing the Bible in the hands of the unlearned and the unstable without furnishing any safeguard against the vagaries of human interpretation. End of section 7. The Bible and the People